Okay. Are you ready? Yep. Stand by. Impact. Neutralize. Impact. Neutralize. Impact. Neutralize. Impact. Neutralize. Hit back! Neutralize! Hit back! Neutralize! Hit back! Neutralize! Hit back! Neutralize! Hit back! I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Too much wind, dude. I honestly, so the problem with that 650 yard target, A, yeah. freaking great shooting. Okay? <laughs> Thanks. The problem it's a, that it's an awesome rifle. That, I, si that 650, I think your second shot on it might have been a hit. Yeah, no, when no. You, I When I was spotting it, it, uh, it was like. Uh, it, it was, was at full apex of swing when the mm -hmm. impact would have struck it, so I couldn't tell. Yeah. The shot after that, I don't think was, and then your last shot definitely was. We'll have okay. to review and post to see if that's the second shot actually was an impact. But I think like that's why I kind of hesitated on that last shot. To take shot. it, I saw you pause. We really, I was listen, I was trying to listen for an audible return. Yeah. Um, and I think you were probably looking at it the same way I was, but so man, were, there, were there were there any outside of six fifty? Were there misses before no. then? No, that was a ridiculous run. The the. The, in so this the, wind, in, in in general, not having a miss and pushing the speed is already like pretty dang impressive. Now, obviously, it's a great rifle. There's really solid optic, and you're shooting great ammunition. But not having any misses on speed is already impressive. Yeah. But to do it in this temperature, in this condition, and I, I know that <laughs> I know that that's probably just sounds like to the audience. Josh, like you don't float my ego anymore. I mean, like, like <laughs> I am complaining. It is. I, I, bodily functions are not working. I can't touch the buttons on the camera. <laughs> so what you guys don't see, Josh's fingers are freezing up because we've been out here all morning. It's been wet. It's, and that's, that's the worst thing to it. It's not just wind. It's, and it's not super cold, but it's also wet. When you're wet and it's cold, we have the slab squat Josh here, whose body is not functioning. So. Josh's fingers were having trouble controlling the cameras, so that's so that's where we're at. It's that cold, right? Where I'm I'm having trouble touching the buttons on the cameras and getting things to work right, and then you just sat down and just freaking shot it. So <laughs> I know that your body is suffering the same thing. So tactile function and all the rest is a mess at the moment. It is easier for me though, because I'm actually closer to the deck and Josh is up there. Um, I will say, the rifle. Uh, obviously delivers the accuracy. Uh, the scope itself with the hold-off points uh, most certainly helped in this wind condition. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say. I, uh, the, the 750, could I have taken it in a calmer, calmer wind day? Yes, I probably could have, but I was not confident in this type of weather. Yes, I'm shooting 77s, uh, but with a 16 inch, I'm not pushing enough velocity for me to be very confident like I would if I was shooting a Mark 12. Um, regardless though, anything to add, Josh? No, let's go ahead take it over to the debrief. We'll see you guys there. Hello there. I'm just here maintaining the nine hole scar so that it's always ready when I need it. But did you know that the first few times we actually took the scar out to pattern it for accuracy, we actually had a very tough time getting any sort of decent results. And it wasn't until we determined that some of these screws here that hold the barrel in place had actually worked themselves loose. But how did we get to that point shooting 
hundreds of rounds of match grade 308 ammunition and working through the problem solving required to get the scar functioning correctly. Well, it's due in no small part to the small but loyal community that we have over on Patreon, who support us with the financials in order to be able to go out and buy ammunition to perform these tests, as well as the emotional and intellectual support that, well, let's be honest, you all know we very much need. So we'd certainly like to have you guys consider joining us over on Patreon. And of course, if that's not something you're interested in, we'd very much like to also just simply hear from you in the comments down below here as well. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of the episode. Onward we go. All right guys, welcome into this debrief for our Speedway run. As usual, what we're going to be doing here is discussing the shooter's performance within the context of the overall run, as well as how different aspects of the base firearm, the optic choice, the cartridge, and all of the associated environmentals we were dealing with on the day affected the run. So with that said, let's get into it. All right, welcome into the debrief for the SCAR-16 Speedway run. Now, it was a horrid day to shoot in terms of the environmentals, and yet you put up an absolute banger of a run. No misses. Clean the course, pure ace. Better than when we did it in slow fire, you know, where we were really just running the practical accuracy setup and, uh, and clocking it all the way out to, um, to the same distances. So I need to understand what was going through your mind that allowed you to be able to perform like this in the moment and how much of it was the firearm versus say your own physical state and presence there on the range. Yeah. So I, I think you hit on a couple things that I suspect we'll talk about at greater length. Your equipment's obviously important. Um, having, uh, the rifle optic and ammunition combination that we had that day, absolutely performed. No doubt about that. But the other part of making something like this type of performance happen always comes down to the shooter. Uh, what was my mental state that day? How was I processing information that was coming in? I mean, yes, it was a suck. It was cold. Uh, but at least it wasn't super hot and we were just drenched in sweat. I find that to be a bit worse. But the environmentals most certainly were not easy that day. I mean, you've got 10 to 21 mile an hour winds. Uh, That's a huge gusting difference, right? I mean, that is Mm -hmm. a monumental difference between 10 and 20 miles an hour. And I'm talking, we're also talking about 5.56. I -hmm. mean, this is not a 7.6251 that we're shooting or 6.5 Creed. So the environmentals most certainly affected it a little more, a lot more. Uh, But as far as my mental state, having a good night's sleep, being in the clear, like I think that morning, I you saw me. I was I was like I wasn't jitter. I wasn't jittery. I was I was awake, and I was processing. You're incredibly but I wasn't focused. Over- incredibly mm-hmm. focused. And there's actually something yeah. I want to touch on on the run. But please continue. Yeah, it wasn't. It there's a clear delineation between over caffeinated and <laughs> alert. Because if you're over caffeinated, you're you're getting into that jittery state, and that's that's not where you want to be. But you want to be alert and you want to be able to process some of the information that's coming in. And I think that was the sort of the X factor in making stuff like this happen uh, when you need to shoot at this type of course. I mean, it is a demanding course. When you say you're processing information, give the audience some idea of what that looks like. What type of information are you processing while you're down on the deck and the buzzer goes off and you, you hit, you know, you load up and you hit there and you're on target? What, what type of information are you specifically looking for um, to make informed decisions about what you're doing on the run? Okay. So like many people in America, like many American soldiers, I'm well versed and and mainly trained on the M16 M4 system, the AR15 system. So as the buzzer pops off, I don't have to think about the loading procedure. I just pop down and load the rifle. And the left hand 
reciprocating charging handle was not that far of a reach for me. So all of that was fairly automated in my mind. Once I get on the scope, I'm also at this point, I've shot enough ACSS to understand where the holds are. But the big thing that I'm processing is then shooting out, observing where the shot is, correlating it to what the environmentals are looking at, looking like, as far as I could tell, and applying any type of changes that I see to the next target. And basically grabbing information, making adjustment, may, and then uh, pushing and continuing that cycle of uh, getting the information, processing, and pushing out. And how much of that, that processing or the visual capability there was enhanced in this particular run with the optic that was, that was on the system? I think it was the, the PLX-C um, from Primary Arms. I, what I remember, and this is what I remember uh, when I'm shooting the course, I'm basically observing what happens to the last target. And then once I see that target being eliminated, I'm pushing on to the next one. So yes, the PLXC reticle does help because then I process the information of what happened on the last target. I'm able to see it through the scope and apply whatever adjustment I need to the next target because the wind may have shifted and may have become stronger, it may have become weaker. It may have pushed the round a little farther to the left, a little farther to the right, or it may be center. And I'm catching that wind and trying to push it and apply it on the next target. So that whole sequence is constantly observed, applied, observed, applied in a, in a cycle all the way down, rinse and repeat, as you would say. Got it. So the reason that I focus so much of those questions on the visual aspect of what you were doing on range is because one of the things I saw in the debrief element of this was observing what your eyes were doing. And I find this really interesting. I'll, I'll tell you why in just a second. But if you watch this run and just pay attention to Henry's eyes, you will see that all the way through the 400-yard target, he did not blink at all. There was one maybe potential like half, half cock of the eyes on one of the mid targets, but throughout the entire sequence... No blinking, just completely dialed in, processing that information, hunting, processing, finding the target, applying the reticle where it needed to be, and so on. Very interesting. Um, and one of the things that uh, I had heard a long time ago uh, when I was first getting serious about shooting was that in films, a lot of the especially like the 90s or early 2000s movies you saw where actors were wearing sunglasses while shooting wasn't just necessarily to make them look cool, but it was because the actors constantly were blinking or flinching due to the muzzle flash and the concussion going off, the firearm going off in front of their face. And so as something part of training and learning to develop as a shooter, one of the things, again, that you learn is how to keep your eyes open and focus and watch what's happening in spite of the natural reaction to want to constantly be blinking as the gun's going off. So I just found it very interesting. It's not to say that Henry doesn't do this on other runs, but with uh, this particular one, it was very evident you were hyper-focused and dialed in. And I bet you probably didn't even realize you were doing it. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, up until you brought it up, I didn't, I didn't know. I, I just processed the, the film and then sent it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so again, an interesting piece there. So I want to get into talking about just a few other pieces. We've talked about the environmentals on the day. Very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about, again, an interesting aspect that you're utilizing and how you're processing the information. Another piece that I saw that uh, I always find interesting was what you were doing with the trigger. Constantly and commonly, you'll hear things like slapping the trigger is a universally bad thing. Universally bad. It is not good. But if you go back and watch Henry's trigger finger throughout the course of this run, on the near targets, say out to 300 or so before he transitions across the range to the 350, he's absolutely slapping the trigger. This is a two-stage trigger, and he's pop all the way through both stages in a single press as he, as that reticle hits where it wants to, as he, the reticle hits where he wants it to go, bam, rounds off. And that changes as the targets get further away and more challenging. You see a very deliberate press through the first stage, find the wall, and then break the second stage of the trigger. Now, Henry, I'm assuming that this is something that you were likely aware that you were doing on the range. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so in a lot of these runs, 
you will see a definitive shift between the short range and, and the medium range targets. And sometimes I'm shifting the rear rest, uh, but the big thing is I'm also shifting my mindset. I'm going from the shorter range, I can gain time aspect to pushing out and, under and pushing myself to understand that I need to be a little bit more precise on the longer targets because my margin of error is decreasing, especially on a windy day. Uh, so yes, uh, to a certain extent, I knew I was doing that, but I still don't pay as much of attention to it as I basically doing a post-op. I, I, com I completely get what yeah. you're saying. It's sort of like you're processing and you know almost in intuitively that you can be less precise with your trigger because of the size of the target and the distance of the target. Right. And so again, yeah. guys, when you hear people unilaterally talk about it is never good or never okay to slap the trigger, you know, people critique things like that, that comes from a fundamental, in my opinion, at least a fundamental misunderstanding of how to balance speed and precision on certain targets and at certain distances. So it's very interesting. And again, a perfect case study watching it happen on camera on this run. Okay, now, so I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this, though. One of the bi bigger focuses on me on the short range is recoil control more so than trigger control. I mean, it sounds terrible that I'm not as focused on trigger control. That's not 100% true, but I'm just more focused on recoil control because I want that second shot to land as quickly as possible. So I'm trying to train my rifle to hold it as steady as possible to make sure that second shot hits. Now, the muzzle brake helps a lot, Yeah. but I also do think that the muzzle brake doesn't, isn't so efficient to where it blasts dust into my eyes and prevents me from observing what happens. Mm -hmm. So that the way the muzzle brake is, is also a good balance between the two because you absolutely do have muzzle brakes that the rifle doesn't move, but it prevents you from seeing better because dust is just all over the place. Very interesting. I wonder how much of that also has to do with the environmentals of the fact that the deck was, you know, very wet on this particular day and you didn't have as much yep. dust or debris floating around. So, you know, you actually bring up a really good point with that and a perfect transition to the next point I wanted to talk about. You've run this with the SCAR 17 and now you've run it mm -hmm. with the 16. Obviously, different platforms in terms of the caliber being the number one thing that is different about them. But the two different rifles are configured relatively similar. Mm -hmm. Talk us through some of the similarities, the differences, and what you're feeling as a shooter shooting these two different rifles side by side. And maybe which is easier, which is more challenging to shoot in your opinion. Again, they're both configured fairly similar. And if you guys haven't seen that SCAR 17 Speedway run, we'll go ahead and drop a link for you. Okay, so the 17 shooting 7.62 NATO, the big boy. Despite it being the big boy cartridge, it doesn't recoil like, let's say, a FAL mm -hmm. or an M110. Uh, those things actually recoil more. Partially, it's because you have a break on the uh, SCAR, and the OG original SCARs actually had the PWS, the, the yes. big like fish yes. gill breaks, <laughs> yes. which are very efficient, but horrible if you ever run CQB with those things. So uh, the SCAR itself is able, for some reason, how, however light it is, is able to shoot without a tremendous amount of recoil. Now, I think part of that comes down to both of the systems having a relatively slow uh, bolt carrier speed. Uh, because it does run slower. And in fact, you could feel it on both of them. The The carrier is almost like an AK. It's like shuck, shuck. Mm -hmm. It just clicks around. And you could, with the SCAR 16, yeah, SCAR 16, the, the small, what we, saw, what we shot, if you press your triggers fast enough, you, you very well can override that speed um, if you are really pushing it. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not, obviously I'm not there um, when I'm shooting speedway uh because i'm not trying to drill short range targets like you know josh is uh trained on uh so with speedway i'm not worried about w with this type of tr trigger speed i'm not worried about overriding the bolt as much i'm just trying to press the trigger as fast as i could process the information and be back on target which with your short range that's well within the capability especially running the 77 grain ammunition uh, it doesn't really add any recoil 
to the system. The system has very low recoil to begin with. Um, but that that's a good point. The, that's a good point. If I can just hop in for a second, because you're you're completely yeah. right. The recoil impulse on the scar, it's not just it doesn't feel like an AR. In my opinion, yeah. there's a material difference between a 5.56 AR, say like something like the Mark 12, for example, in the in the unsuppressed mm-hmm. category, um, and the Scar 16. There is it, it. There is a much more. You feel that mass moving around within the gun. You really do, and it's. I wouldn't say that that it makes it worse per se, but I, I personally can shoot 5.56 ARs, the DI systems. Um, probably i would say faster and better uh, but again so, that just comes down to to me i would say if you look at the ak niner it kind of feels like that mm-hmm. but the ak niner is a gas checked ak exactly so most of your ak's yeah most of your ak's are way over gas to where yeah there's a long action but it's also over gas where it's pumping that bolt carrier speed way faster than it really needs to be mm-hmm. the scar on the other hand is not over gassed it is very well gassed mm-hmm. Well, this one, the the two that you have at sure. least are very well gassed. Uh, so, I mean, it does create a very a interesting example. recoil. Yeah, uh, it's the AK Niner and the Scar Sixteen actually have a similar recoil, um, uh, the, the recoil impulse for that particular reason. And you very well could override the AK Niner, especially if you're shooting something super light like um, the Steelcase Tula type of stuff. Right. Uh, but as far as this particular run goes, I feel like there was very little recoil impulse transmitted to my shoulder to really throw things off uh, that much. And on top of that, it's also uh, got a muzzle break. So when you're comparing that to the big boy scar, just by virtue of using a smaller cartridge, I'm able to tag those short ranges you know, with more gusto. Yeah, your, your pacing was... Your pacing on this mm-hmm. entire run, I felt was was perfect. Uh, I, I felt mm-hmm. like the pacing, the speed, the sequence, the speed you took between each target got it at least felt as though it got gradually, you know, gradually longer as you got further away, just as you would expect. Um, the splits got gradually longer the further and further we got away. But you were still, I mean, you were still on it. Don't don't get me wrong. To the point where, and we alluded to this on range, um, we actually had missed what we, or I had missed the call of your second hit on the 650-yard target because you hit it so fast the target was still in the, the swing mm-hmm. <laughs> from the previous round impacting it. So I... I mean that's that's pretty darn fast shooting for torso size targets or sub torsos rather. Now that's that's actually a good point to kind of bring up. Like the the advantages that you have with a scar light, the light round, light recoiling, fast impact, that all loses out when you get into the longer distance targets that the scar seventeen then has the advantage towards bucking wind, uh, pushing a heavier cartridge. Um, transmitting that uh, that energy onto the longer distance target that that just is not there for the scar light, and I think we're able to see some of it. I mean, it still moved the 650 target per se, but I think what I thought was a miss then affected me thinking, okay, all right, maybe I should not take the final target. Yeah. And just claim it up to this point, because if I'm having two misses right here, that 725, the 720 yeah, even more uh, yard target, right? yeah. that's probably going to be more of a liability. Now looking back, realizing that, no, it was just very difficult to call it a hit, sort of still translates, right? Mm-hmm. Because you still don't have that energy to push through. Do I want to be standing there at that distance when someone's shooting this particular rifle at me? The answer is no. Not just no, but hell no. <laughs> but between the scar heavy and the scar light, if I had a choice between shooting either of those two, and I know my distances are more like Afghanistan's like 700 meter range, yeah, I, it's probably going to be the scar heavy to guarantee right. me with a, a longer radius. Right, maintaining some of that, that energy further out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Punching through mud huts on... on 
in that aspect if you're trying to defeat uh, barriers if you're trying to push distance in, in those aspects the scar 17 absolutely has an advantage at the distance side right one of the differences between the scar 17 setup that we ran and the 16 setup was the stock we had the UGG boot on the 17, and obviously we've shot the UGG boot on the 16 as well. We've shot the KDGs on both of them. Um, did you feel a material difference or improvement between, say, shooting the UGG boot versus the KDG stock? Or the, what is it? It's the uh, ACR style stock. I mean, aesthetics. So just the aesthetics. Performance-wise, you didn't feel a, a, a significant or even palpable difference? Let's say I felt that I looked better on camera. So it must have translated over. But as far as the comb height, the length of pull and all that... What about the st I just the no overall sturdiness? I think we both would say when we handle the, KG, the KDG uh, stroke ACR style stock... We both thought, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, this is much more solid than the Ugg boot style yeah. stock. But when you were shooting it, yes. did that carry true? the same. No, I felt the same, to be honest. Like for, for my style of shooting, what I did on this run, it felt the exact same to me. And that's my uncultured take on it, of course. I actually don't think that it's that uncultured because in spite of the fact that when I'm handling it, I go, oh, yeah, this is way more solid. When I'm actually shooting, I actually don't notice really a difference at all so oh, yeah again just uh okay. an interesting point of conversation there based on what is normally uh, perpetuated online all right so overall again we talked about an absolutely banger of a run here a perfect all the way out perfect through 650 two for two on every target i mean that's pretty darn incredible now we talked earlier about some of the advantages of the optic. I want to talk a little bit more about philosophically why I think it fits on the SCAR light, and then also just give you a few more uh, seconds to talk through, again, and explain some of the advantages and, and uh, that you actually saw shooting it. So the PLXC is specifically like the lightweight, trimmed down, short version of the old PLX, or at least the newest iteration that then falls into that, again, fairly differentiable bucket, as far as I'm concerned, from many other optics that are out there in the LPVO category. I mean, this is definitely focused on weight and size. In my mind, that fit perfectly with the functional elements we were going for between, say, the SCAR 17 and the slimmed down, lighter SCAR 16. So those two pieces are why we you know, effectively went with the PLXC on this, op, uh, on this rifle, seemed to fit the use and configuration setup we were going for. It also has a lot of the advantages we were looking for and do look for in this style of shooting. Speed, distance, and close range when we do bring it in. So Henry, you already did allude to the advantages you see within the ACSS reticle, especially for this type of shooting. Why don't you talk just overall briefly about what you thought about shooting the optic? It's brand new to the market. I'm sure people be interested to hear what you have to say, having been behind it at speed on the clock. Right. So, yeah, like Josh was saying, there's a lot to the optic that we are not testing it on for this particular segment. Right now, we're just looking at its core contributions to a speedy distance run uh, rather than its long-term durability carryability and, and all of that which i will say i entirely agree with josh as far as a portability it makes a lot of sense to use the uh the scar or the the plxc with the scar now i will say though the um the the eye box is is it a little tighter on this one well with respect to the eye box i mean i i don't know that it's a tight eye box i actually think that the eye box itself is is fairly uh forgiving on this optic but unlike other optics where when you when you move off that center lines you know that dead center point and where you would normally hit the black 
and, and start to see, you know, like the shadows around the sides of the optic as you fall outside the eye box. On this particular optic, I've noticed that for me, I get um, almost like a fish eye or fishbowl-esque effect, which is really different. I've never seen that. And it's not when I'm looking through it normally. It's when I come off center. Instead of seeing black, I see like the, the fishbowl looking effect, which I suppose while it's different and it sort of was like, I, I didn't understand what I was seeing or why it was doing that at first. Now that I've sort of identified it, I think it's probably maybe even better than just seeing black because you can still sort of see through it at mm -hmm. that moment. I don't know. No, so so that's, I guess that's sort of what I'm, it's a little bit more sensitive to where your eye is, is I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, which that is still fine for a SCAR-16 that has a superbly light recoiling system. So the SCAR-16 definitely plays into the PLXC is the big thing that I'm trying to, uh, to say. And if we're just looking at the glass clarity when you're in the eye box and shooting out to distance, it's less vivid. But at the same time, I could still spot, if you couldn't tell, I could still spot where, where the vegetation, what the vegetation was doing. I was still able to spot shot for shot going all the way out what the cartridge, what the projectile was doing. Um, so, and then on top of that, the most important thing, of course, with the ACSS system is being able to take that data and translate it into usable and, and effective corrections. And so that's where the reticle comes in and translating it into an effective correction, wind correction at that point, and a distance correction. And so all of that matched up fairly well. Because you did, uh, you, there was no I, dialing, nothing like that, right? You just used with the holdovers in the reticle all the way out to 650, correct. right? Yeah. Correct, yeah. One of yeah. the things that I've also noticed shooting this particular optic is the field of view. It, despite the fact that it is a compact style LPVO, um, where you know, maybe what we've hit on thus far is that there might be some sacrifices where you're seeing, maybe we perceive it as less vivid, or we see some, you know, maybe there's some sensitivity with respect to where your eye needs to be, so on and so forth. Those are trade-offs that are fairly common when you go down to such a lightweight, small package. One of the things I noticed, though, that was sort of different with respect to that is normally you also lose a bunch of field of view in these smaller, um, these LPVOs that are designed for that. But the PLXC actually boasts one of the largest field of views of any LPVO yeah. on the market. And I'm curious if how much of it maybe you actively noticed versus passively noticed as you were transitioning between the targets on the range. I mean, I, I noticed it. I mean, compare that to your uh, your Night Force. What was it? The F... Um... The attacker. No, not... The, oh, the well, NXA. It, it was... The NX-8, correct. Yeah, yeah the, the really lightweight Night Force. Yes, the, the one that I would, would line up I with the PLXC, right? Correct. I, I would absolutely choose a PLXC over the NX-8. I mean, that's that's no question about that. Uh, because it does balance a lot of what you would actually want a scope to do. Uh, it balances that stuff extremely well. Yeah. Got it. Perfect. Well, look, guys, I think that that sums up what was, in effect, an absolutely phenomenal run. We hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at the SCAR-16 on the Speedway right along with us here. And until next time, we'll see you on the range.